Welcome to our fourth webinar in the series of Hyperion Heritage Science, uh, European Research Infrastructure for Heritage Science Academy program of webinars. My name is Matthias Sterlich and I'm Professor of Heritage Science at University College London and Professor of Analytical Chemistry at University of Ljubljana. And it is my big pleasure today to introduce the two speakers who are going to introduce us to the RCLAP platform. RCLAP offers transnational access to heritage science information, such as data or technical documentation and sample archives, but also to experts with specialist knowledge about those archives, which may significantly enhance the benefits to researchers. RCLAP collections are an excellent resource collected through many, many decades of research and are freely available for access through the project Hyperion Heritage Science in 14 prestigious European museums, conservation centers and other institutions. Our first speaker will be Astrid Harth. She studied art history at Ghent University and paintings conservation at the University of Antwerp. Since 2015, she's been studying as a PhD researcher at the copying practices of 16th century, century Netherlandish painters at Ghent University. She's a member of the Ghent Interdisciplinary Center for Art and Science focusing on the art historical study of material aspects of artistic artifacts. Recently, she received the grant from the Research Foundation Flanders to study the historical significance of the mid 16th century overpaint campaign of the Ghent altarpiece. So I hope, Astrid, that you will join us again in the future uh, to talk about this fascinating project. Our second speaker is Maria Martin Hill, uh, who's been the head of the Department for Research and Training at the Spanish Cultural Heritage Institute of the Ministry of Culture and Sports since 2014. She's responsible for the establishment of the strategy and priorities for cultural heritage conservation research and for the training program at the Institute, focusing on interdisciplinarity, specialization and quality. I'd just like to remind all the participants that this session is being recorded and that there will be an opportunity for everyone to ask questions of our speakers. Please do write those questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screens, and we will do our best to either respond to your questions during the presentation or after the uh, two presentations. At this moment, um, I'd like to hand over my hand over the screen to Astrid. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for having me today for uh, this fabulous webinar and also thank you, Mattia, for the lovely introduction. So what I would like to share uh, during my part of today's presentation is um, actually my personal experience with the ArchLab research platform. So, okay. Um, and I would like to stress that I tremendously benefited throughout my PhD research um, of this unique platform. So as a title slide already indicates, I will focus on one of the case studies of my PhD research from which, for which I actually use the ArchLab platform. So in general, my PhD research focused on the study of painted copies by Netherlandish masters through the lens of early modern conceptions of copying, roughly in the period between 1520 up to the late 1560s. So, or that is to say the period when the religious and political climate shifted in the Netherlands from pragmatic toleration and doctoral pluralism to consolidating institu institutional authority. 
The case study in question is a full-scale painted copy after the Gans altarpiece made in the late 1550s by Michiel Coxy, who was a Netherlandish painter's painter from the Habsburg entourage. So the presentation will consist of two main parts. First, I would like to introduce the case study by providing you some background information, as well as by discussing some of the issues that emerge within art historical scholarship on the subject when consulting technical data. In the second part, in turn, I will focus on the value of the ArchLab platform for my research. Therefore, I will tell you more about the institutes I visited via the ArchLab platform to actually study Coxie's copy from a more technical perspective. And I will also briefly discuss in what ways my research benefited from the resources and expertise available at these institutes. So first allow me to actually introduce the case study at hand. As already mentioned, the case study is a full-scale copy of the Ghent altarpiece produced by Michiel Coxy, presumably between 1557 and 1558. This, uh, this copy, which you see here, um, of which you see here a composite image on the presentation slide, was actually commissioned around 1556 by Philip II ruler of the Habsburg territories, which included the Netherlands at the time. And as documentary sources indicate, it was finished before January 5059, when it was transported on three wagons from Ghent to Brussels. So it is ex actually estimated based on primary written sources that Michiel Coxy worked about two years on the copy, probably in situ, that is in the Veit Chapel, which is one of the chapels of St. Bavo Cathedral in Ghent, where the original artwork, artwork by the brothers Hubert and Jan van Eyck was installed since 1432. So here at the right, uh, at the left side, you can see the original masterpiece by the famous brothers van Eyck. And I should mention that this is a photograph taken prior to the current conservation project. On the right side, you see then St. Bavo Cathedral, um, as well as the Veit Chapel, the exterior, as well as today's interior where the Ghent altarpiece was originally installed. At present, only 10 panels of Coxie's copy are preserved, which are held in three different museums across Northern Europe, namely in the Royal Museum of Fine Arts of Belgium, in the Staatliche Museum zu Berlin, and in the Alte Pinakothek in Munich. The panels depicting the Adam and Eve and part of the annunciation scene are in turn considered lost at present. As you can easily observe on this presentation slide, the copy produced by Michiel Coxy deviates from our modern day conception of the artistic practice of copying, in which copies are understood more as exact replication that lacks creativity, innovation, as well as originality. If we compare, for example, the exterior panels of the original masterpiece, which you see here at the left, and its 16th century copy, it becomes clear that Michiel Coxy introduced significant alterations during the copying process. So for instance, Michiel Coxy did not reproduce the portraits of the Ghent altarpiece original donors, which you see here is Jos Veit and his wife, Elisabeth Borlut. And he omitted as well the figure of St. John the Baptist, who is represented here in Grisaille holding a lamb. Instead, what did Coxy? He depicted in the lower register the four evangelists, so which you can see, we can identify it from left to right as uh, John the Evangelist, St. Matthew, St. Mark and St. Luke, who are, of course, the authors of the four Gospels in the New Testament. Moreover, what we can deduce here is that Coxie portrayed these novel figures in his own painterly style, 
which is more reminiscent of the classical idiom of the high Italian Renaissance, rather than the Van Eyck's brother, now very famous naturalistic style. In the recent years, art historians mainly focused in their studies on these formal and stylistic deviations of Coxie's copy that can be easily discerned, as I have indicated, by means of visual analysis. So art historians mapped out these differences and tried to reveal facts about their significance in their own time. However, the technical evidence obtained by means of imaging and analytical techniques in the recent years shows that Coxie at the same time tried to reproduce large parts of the Ghent altarpiece depicted scenes rather faithfully while introducing intentional changes in other areas like those just mentioned. So telling examples of Coxie's practice to faithfully reproduce parts of the Ghent altarpiece are here the three enthroned figures representing in the middle Christ or God the Father, the Virgin at the left and Saint John the Baptist at the right. Here actually Coxie copied the, the figures very closely with a keen eye for detail, as well as with technical fineness. So he even went so far in using during his copying, during his copying process the complex and time consuming, as well as somewhat outdated technique of press brocade employed by the Van Eyck brothers in the background of the central panel, which you see here, rather than actually imitating it with paint, which was more common in the 16th century to do. So clearly from all this demonstrates that the relationship between the Ghent altarpiece and Coxie's copy is far more complex than commonly assumed by art historians. More precisely, Coxie's copying process is characterized by two distinct historical conceptions of copying. The first one is a classical concept of emulation, which actually urged artists to demonstrate in their copies their inventive skills, as well as historical consciousness by introducing alterations to their models. The second concept adopted by Coxie adheres in turn to a medieval Christian concept of copying, which promoted the exact replication of divinely revealed prototypes for the production of religious imagery. So actually what ArchLab um, enabled me to do was to observe the different approaches adopted by Michiel Coxie during his copying process of the Ghent altarpiece, just by actually consulting technical data on this copy. Hence, my research conducted via ArchLab offered a different avenue of art historical in inquiry from which profounder insights could be gained about the artist as well as the patron's own understanding and expectations of the copy after the Ghent altarpiece. The institutes which, which I visited via the ArchLab platform to conduct this research on Coxie's copy of the Ghent altarpiece were the Royal Institute for Cultural Heritage in Brussels, also known as the Kik Irpa, as well as the Gemilde de Galerie in Berlin. So actually the main reasons why I chose both institutes, institutes for my research is that they compress all currently available technical data on Michiel Coxie's copy, which ranges from infrared reflectographs to paint samples. But what was equally equally beneficial for my research was the in-house expertise of researchers like for instance Hélène Dubois who produced or studied these technical documents as well. This available expertise enabled me more precisely to discuss my own findings, um, also to fine-tune them, but as well as to recognize my own research biases which is um, very important for a scholar. <laughs> So finally, what I would like to point out and really what I would like to stress here is that ArchLab allowed me not only to consult available technical data on Coxie's copy, but also to study it next to some of the preserved panels themselves. This was particularly the case during my research stay in Berlin, 
which was facilitated by the Stiftung Preußischer Kulturbesitz, the Institution for Heritage Science of the Städtliche Museum zu Berlin. And this is really, truly a highly unique situation for an art historian, definitely working in an academic environment, as it is mostly a privilege reserved for curators, museum conservators, and conservation scientists. So in sum, ArchLab does create unique opportunities for art historians, and therefore it goes without saying that I highly recommend this research platform to any scholar interested in the study of cultural objects from a more interdisciplinary perspective. So to conclude, I hope this brief presentation has given you some ideas about the value of ArchLab for art historians, as well as other scholars in the humanities who indulge in the study of historical artifacts. I particularly um, wanted to highlight with my own experience, as well as with my case study, that the ArchLab platform not only makes technical data about historical artifacts accessible, but it also makes available a vast expertise of in-house researchers present at the institutes associated with ArchLab. And above all, I hope that you all got a glimpse of how ArchLab enables researchers like myself to work together in an interdisciplinary manner to to gain actually more knowledge about our cultural heritage. So thank you for your attention. And I would like to give the floor now to Maria. You, you may need to sure. unmute. Sure. Thank you, Astrid, and I think that your um, Example is an, is, an, is an excellent uh, example for the possibilities that our lab offer. Uh, thank you also to Mattia and the rest of the uh, coordination team in Hyperion HS for inviting me to this presentation. Um, I will present our lab as the platform uh, as the key to heritage science archives. Uh, as you may know our lab, as the rest, the other two platforms are supported by the European project Hyperion HS, which joins 24 national partners, meaning 67 institutions with a duration of three years and a half, and provide the access to three transnational access platforms, meaning 55 providers. Um, and the um, with two um, remarkable points, I think the excellence is the is the key point for for the access for the projects and the access the accesses themselves, and it's very important also to remark that the accesses are free, but are supported entirely by the by the project. The platforms, the three transnational um, access platforms, are are lab the access to the archives in prestigious institutions, museums, and conservation centers, fixed lab, the access to fixed um, instrumentation, such as accelerators and so on, and MOLAB, the access to mobile techniques, techniques such as um, such a X or F or, or Raman or any other that move to the place where the, the, the cultural item is. Um, but as it has been already said, it's not only the, the access to the, to the platforms, but the access to the expertise. And this is a very important aspect because it's the access also to the people, the people responsible for, the, um, uh, for this documentation, people that has been working in this field for many years, people responsible of the techniques. And this is an excellent opportunity of, an, uh, of a network and enhances the, the benefits of any access and any collaboration. These are real comments uh, from users in the previous project, Iperion C8. The Art Lab access has been a great experience and opportunity of professional growth, as well as a guide for the development of my research. 
or acquiring information useful for the interpretation of the results of my further analysis in order to develop conclusions of scientific validity and evidence. And the discussions were extraordinarily detailed and marked by a remarkable openness on both sides to share all available documents and information and to advance as much as possible in resolving the enigmas. Uh, I would add to these comments uh, as advanced today. Okay, let's concentrate on our lab. Our, the, our lab platform uh, provides the access to 14 providers and therefore 14 archives in very prestigious uh, museum conservation center and institutions, such as the Royal Museum of Art and History and the Kikirpa in Belgium, the museums in Berlin, in Germany, the Spanish Cultural Heritage Institute, where I work, the C2RMF in France, also the, the Laboratory for Research in Historical Monuments, the Opificio de la Pietre Dure, the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, also with the Cultural Heritage Agency, the National Institute of Heritage in Romania, the Craft Laboratory in Sweden, and in UK, the Historic England Laboratory, the National Gallery, and the British Museum. Um, in these institutions, very well known, um, the, the information from many, many years and decades of research is kept. And <clears throat> so they provide the access to all this information that goes from images, X-ray, radiographies, infrared reflectographies, but also to uh, um, chromatographs or any other, <coughs> sorry, analytical data, but also to the samples and reference materials. I will use some examples and uh, some other examples of success stories uh, to that I know quite well as there were accesses to the, to the IBC where I work <clears throat> in order to explain this, the possibilities a little bit more. Those are accesses in the previous project, Iperium C8. The first one, Cito Luna. This is the project, the possible intervention of Michael Cito in the execution of the altarpiece of the Luna Chapel in the Toledo Cathedral. Um, in the, um, the IPC, we had been working in a project, in a research project, um, that is studied in a very interdisciplinary and, and deep way, the lunar altarpiece in the Toledo Cathedral. Um, the user that wanted to access to this information was uh, Matthias Benike, the very well-known uh, Michael Cito expert. So during the project and after all the, this complete study, um, uh, different techniques were applied. And it's very uh, interesting because the contract of this altarpiece is, is, uh, exists today. And only two masters are uh, in this, in this in this contract, uh, Sancho de Zamora and Juan de Segovia. After the study, as you can see in, the, in this infrared photography images, a third hand appeared. This was confirmed with the different techniques and uh, it was supposed, it was indicated during the project that this was the Michael Cito's hand and uh, that this is, um, Michael Cito was working in Spain, but not much is known about how he entered Spain and how he started. So that's the reason why Matthias Benninger uh, came here. He was very interested in discussing and, and access to this, to this information. We had the opportunity to, to discuss, to uh, solve the information. And, um, and after this, uh, this collaboration has a result, for example, in these two publications, a publication from the project uh, that is in Spanish, but also a uh, reference to the Iperion CH access, on the RLAP access, in the Michael Cito catalog from the exhibition at the, uh, the National Gallery in Washington. 
in 2018. But sometimes the users want to access to, to samples, and this was the case of Vanessa Antunes. She accessed, accessed uh, uh, the Spanish Cultural Heritage Institute uh, in order to check uh, the information and to have the access to the archives concerning Francisco de Zurbarán, the 17th century famous a Spanish painter. Uh, her project, Simpos, Spanish Influences in Portuguese Ovidos Workshop, is centered in the study of uh, Josefa de Ovidos. Uh, she was a painter, a Portuguese painter, um, that Lerner was working with her father, Jose de Ovidos, who was working before with Zurbarán. Zurbarán, Francisco de Zurbarán, has a very unique way of, of, of uh, working in the preparation of the paintings. So Vanessa Antunas wanted to compare her samples from Josefa de Ovidos to those that we keep from Francisco de Zurbarán in order to find similarities and to compare them. Uh, here you can find in the left the studies in Zurbarán, made by a chemist in the, in the Spanish Cultural Heritage Institute, or from the Spanish Cultural Heritage Institute. And then this were the sessions with Vanessa Antunes, the discussion and the access to the samples using the, uh, the, uh, the images in the, in the electron microscope. Uh, this is such an interesting project that Vanessa Antunes want to go further. And she applied to IPM HS uh, and the, her proposal passed. So we will have the opportunity to meet her again uh, during this year, continue with, with this project. Okay, let's go back to the, to the providers, to the lab providers, because from the IPM CH project to this uh, IPM HS project, we have six new providers. And it's very interesting that some of them cover an aspect that was not was not previously previously uh, covered. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm talking about the University of Groningen, the Craft Laboratory, and the Historic England uh, Laboratory. It covers aspects as archaeology, archaeology, and so on, and and the craft uh, uh, aspects. And um, Actually, in Iperium HS um, access call, um, a project uh, has passed uh, for the today historic England. Uh, the project is Comops, the development of complex metal structures in ancient roads and steel. The picture is not quite representative, sorry uh, for this, but the, the user, Francesco Grazzi, want to uh, access to the information that they keep in the historic England about uh, ancient metal artifacts, uh, pre-Roman and Roman period, um, that have been stud already studied with techniques, uh, techniques such as uh, um, X-ray, metallography, electron microscopy, and so on. Techniques that means uh, the use of samples. So it's quite, uh, useful to to get to this information before considering any uh, sample taking and so this this will be the access not complete at the moment but uh, we will give some information other times so now let me give you some thoughts and this is a very personal thought that to me, our lab is a, it's a sustainable platform in terms that it uh, fulfills the three R's principles of uh, reducing, recycling, and reusing information. So that's very, very interesting. So let's go now in order to finish with my presentation to, with some practical information on how to access our lab or any other transnational access platform. This is an image of the IPO HS webpage, and I have marked the how to access point in the services menu. There you can find a lot of information about the process. But um, in order to resume, so what, are, what would be the steps to, 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 for an access? The first would be to have a research idea. Yeah? 
as, as you have seen with these uh, success stories that have been presented today. Uh, secondly, we really recommend to contact the user help desk, uh, the peer use user help desk. They would orientate and, uh, and this, this information would, would really uh, be very useful. After this, the registration and uh, uh, through the IP on HS website is needed and also to present the, the proposal. Then uh, an evaluation process starts that takes no more than two months. Uh, and if the proposal passed this evaluation, then the user is free to arrange and perform the access with the provider and, of course, perform the access duties uh, that are indicated. Um, the catalog, the Iberian HS catalog, is also uh, available in the web page. And this, this opportunity is available for researchers established in the, the European Union member state, but any other uh, European program beneficiaries. Um, the, the access has to be transnational. This means that the, the, the provider and the institution where the user works have to be in different countries. And uh, of course, uh, the user has, and the, the access itself has to comply with the IPVM HS access and service policy, that means terms on uh, intellectual property and so on. And this is also available in the web page. About the evaluation and criteria, uh, there are two aspects. The technical aspect um, that concerns the provider in terms of, of being time, for example, in fixed lab, but also um, the feasibility in any other institution for many, many reasons. Maybe there is some confidential information or maybe uh, there are many other reasons. And also the scientific evaluation. Um, this scientific evaluation made by a peer review panel considers the scientific excellence, the state of the art, the topic, the dissemination plan, the expertise of the user group, and the potential impact. And uh, just a few comments about the, the cutoff dates of the calls, but let me remark that the call is always open. You can always present your proposal, but of course, uh, it has been marked at the end of this month in the screen, the cutoff dates in order to start the evaluation process and so on. And if you need some further inspiration, you can check the APMC8 webpage where all the accesses that uh, uh, were made under this project are uh, available, at least the, the reports. So, uh, uh, let's comment to, to encourage you to take advantage of this excellent opportunity. And uh, thank you very much. This is all by my side. Give the word to Mattia. Mattia Stili. Thank you very much, Astrid and Maria, for your uh, amazing presentations. I learned an awful lot, both about the Ghent Altar and as well uh, about the RCLAP platform of IPR in HS. Um, little, there is little that remains for us today, um, except to invite everyone to attend the fifth webinar in our series to be held on the 14th of September. And this will focus on built heritage and how Iberian HS uh, facilities can help us understand built or immovable heritage better. This webinar will be organized by Dr. Ralph Killian of the Fraunhofer Institution, and I invite everyone to attend it. Thank you very much for your attention.